Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on access to justice for the right to housing. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd. My name is Luciana Berkovic. Um, in a moment, you will hear from Adrián Di Giovanni from the International Development Research Center, who will moderate this conversation. During this webinar, you will hear first from the UN Special Reporter on the Right to Adequate Housing, Leilani Farah, who will present the highlights for her recently launched report on access to justice for the right to housing. And then a group of practitioners and activists who work on legal empowerment in informal settlement will provide some notes on the report and how it can be used on their context to advocate for policy changes. Um, before we get too far into today's presentation, I have some brief housekeeping items. First, take note that this event is being recorded. Uh, we will share the full recording and highlights later on our website and by email. Uh, I also want to, be, to make sure that you can hear well and are able to use our webinar system. You will see a questions panel where you can type in your comments and communicate with us. There is also a button for raising your hand to get our attention. Uh, please type in your questions, comments, ideas and suggestions uh, in the questions panel as we move along. Uh, after the presentations, we will open up the floor to take questions and thoughts. And the moderator will also collect the questions you type in while the panelists are talking. Madi, Marta and Mohamed will be fielding questions today and also taking some notes. Uh, finally, I want to invite you all to join the Global Legal Empowerment Network to learn about future online and in-person opportunities and events, showing advocacy strategies to advance access to justice and participate in our online forum in which, for example, you can join a discussion with people from all over the world on the use of legal empowerment in informal settlements. Um, with that, uh, let's start our discussion and hear from Adrian. Hi, good morning everyone, or good evening, depending on uh, which part of the world you're in. Thank you very much, Luciana, for introducing our webinar, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. I'm really delighted to be here in Ottawa, Canada, to present um, the topic for our discussion. And so, just a note, I work with the International Development Research Centre. We're part of Canada's um, official international assistance, and, and really what our role is and we try to do is to support local voices and organizations um, in the global south to try to build evidence and identify solutions to what um, are identified and what we see as some of the most vexing challenges that societies face and to the extent possible we also try to take some of the local experiences and assist our partners and colleagues in other countries to help shape and feed global debates and, and global norms and today's discussion is very much in that spirit so uh, the topic of our conversation is um, it takes legal empowerment to solve um, the housing crisis and I'm just going to quickly introduce two elements um, to that um, topic and the first is what do we mean by the housing crisis and in a sense we already have that information um, briefly from the invitation that was sent out for today's webinar and just to give a few statistics um, an estimated 1.8 billion people around the world lack adequate housing 25% um, of the world's urban population live in informal settlements slums favelas barrios depending on some of the more vernacular terminology um, and just you know, homelessness and forced evictions are on the rise in virtually every country. And so at the heart of it are challenges for people to ensure a roof over their heads and a dignified place to call home. Now, solving these challenges present an array of dimensions and challenges related, for example, to public financing and infrastructure, to housing, to housing but also to sanitation and health and also debates about urban planning and, and how best to organize the world's ever-growing urban centers and cities and populations and, and so why then focus on legal empowerment and access to justice and that's the the second element um, a few thoughts and while not the whole story the lack of housing at its root is a challenge of justice and guaranteeing some of the most basic um, human rights and uh, too often housing is treated as a co commodity or as a luxury when um, 
as the special rapporteur who on the right to housing who we'll hear from briefly has underscored and this was in a in in her previous report um, on informal sentiments in the right to housing as she's pointed out those who resist forced eviction and claim their right to housing must be treated as human rights defenders so there's really two sides to um, this problem on, on the one hand are some of the most inhumane circumstances that people in formal settlements the urban poor are faced with but on the other hand in the face of some of the most challenging conditions people community residents advocates have been able to carve out a path to accessing justice and today we're going to hear from some of the actors who have supported residents and the urban poor people in the face of vulnerability to claim their rights to housing um, under national co constitutions and as part of broader guarantees to the adequate standard of living which is enshrined in article 11 of the international covenant on economic social and cultural rights so today we're going to try to capture a set of experiences on securing access to houses for the right to housing. There's three parts to our discussion. The first part we're going to hear from Leilani Farha, who's the UN Special Rapporteur, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing. She's been in that role since May 2014. And in a recent report to the UN's Human Rights Council, she presented a report which essentially provides a roadmap for how to achieve access to justice for the right to housing in the form of 10 guidelines. So first we're going to turn to Leilani to present that report, followed in the second part by reactions from um, activists and advocates from four countries, uh, Nigeria, Argentina, Kenya and Mexico, from a set of organizations who have really been frontline supporting communities to know, use and shape the law for improved rights to housing. And so I'll just mention the names and the organizations of pre presenters now and, and we'll hear and maybe see from them in a bit. So first we'll be hearing from Megan Chapman, who's the co-founder and co-director of Justice and Empowerment Initiatives in Nigeria. Um, from there, we'll jump to Latin America and hear from Pablo Vitale, who is the coordinator of the Right to City program for the Asociación Civil por la Igualdad y Justicia. Then we'll jump back to Africa and hear from Emily Kinama, who is a research and litigation associate and also an advocate of the High Court in Kenya, and she's working with Katiba Institute in Kenya. And finally, we'll hear from Maria Silvia Emanuele, from the Habitat International Coalition in Mexico, who's um, coordinator of their Latin American programs. That's the second part. And then the third part, we're going to open up for questions um, and comments from the larger audience. Please, if you have any questions, send them to us through the questions panel that's within the webinar screen. You should hopefully see it, and we'll answer them during the question and answer portion. Um, les questions sont très bienvenues en français, on va répondre en anglais, et les questions en espagnol también sont um, les bienvenues, y vamos a discutir, pero en inglés. And following that, we're going to send links to keep the discussion going virtually. So thank you for um, joining today. We're going to jump quickly now to Leilani Farah, who's going to prevent, present the report, she says, for the first time that was recently presented to the Human Rights Council of the UN. Thank you, Leilani, and welcome. Leilani, you're on mute. Please jump in. And There we go. That got it? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Adrian, uh, for organizing this um, and for the Legal Empowerment Network, which I really must be part of, I now realize. Um, this is really a, a delight for me, a delight to be in conversation with all of you and the many people on the webinar. Um, I have to admit, um, it's the second time I've presented this report. The last time was at the United Nations in a very different context. I'm very pleased with this report and I'm pleased with this webinar. There's a way in which um, in my work as rapporteur, access to justice is, is almost like a secret in my work in that when I'm talking with governments, whether it's municipal governments or whether it's national level governments, it is the most difficult conversation that I have. I can talk about almost any other aspect of housing and have a pretty easy flow. But the minute I start talking about access to justice, everyone's back gets up. And so I felt before I finished my tenure as rapporteur, it was really important to come out with a report that kind of um, came clean about the fact 
um, that this is actually the essential issue in my mind with respect to the right to adequate housing. Um, so what I thought I would do is um, go through, just leave you with three points, sort of three key things that I want people to take from this report. The first one is that I want people to understand that housing conditions worldwide are a result of states and other actors having failed to recognize housing as a human right and that the denial of access to justice is an, an embodiment of that failure. And I'm gonna take, I'm, I'm gonna go through the three points and then I'm gonna go through them in more detail just so that you have a sense of where I'm headed in this present brief presentation. So that's the first point. The second point I want you to come away with is that while states, and that's like all levels of government, can determine how best to ensure access to justice, they cannot determine whether to ensure access to justice for the right to adequate housing. And the third point I wanna leave you with is that access to justice extends well beyond courts and shouldn't be viewed narrowly as only the domain of courts. Okay, so let me take you to the first point that housing conditions worldwide are a result of the failure of states and other actors to recognize housing as a human right, and that the denial of access to justice is an embodiment of that failure. I think Adrian already provided us with a really good uh, overview of, um, of the housing conditions. Um, he said 1.8 billion people lack adequate housing worldwide. Um, we should all be kind of shaking our heads when we hear that because none of us know what 1.8 billion people means really. I mean, it's a, it is a huge number of people. Um, when you have a quarter of the world's urban population living in informal settlements, you know that the bulk of that quarter of the world's population may be lacking services like basic services like water and sanitation, electricity. Um, we know that homelessness is on the rise pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, I can't even tell you some of the things I've seen. I've just myself as rapporteur and, and many of you uh, on this webinar um, will have seen similar things. People living in the most dire of, of circumstances um, in both affluent countries and less affluent countries. I just got back from France. And it, it actually was one of my most harrowing missions. The, the conditions that I saw there were some of the worst that I've seen uh, and made worse, of course, when you think of the resources in the sixth richest country in the world. Um, so, I mean, my position has long been that all of these are violations um, of the right to adequate housing, of course, but they are, um, at also equally failures of access to justice. So they're not just failures of housing programs, they're actually failures of access to justice. And the way I get there um, in the report and just conceptually and intellectually um, is that if we don't provide access to justice for violations of the right to adequate housing, it means that the actual violations are not being brought to light that that the causes of the violations are not being identified. There's no place for them to be identified um, formally. And there is no place to fashion a remedy um, or have responses identified. Um, in fact, the way access to justice works right now is, is the, uh, in the area of housing is in fact the flip of what should be happening. Most people who are living in homelessness or who have been forcibly evicted or are threatened with forced eviction, um, their interaction with the justice system or with justice is that it's being used against them. In other words, the justice system is used to criminalize people who are living in homelessness or the justice system is used to evict people who are, are, are living on, on lands in their own homes. Um, and so, um, obviously, um, the report is an attempt 
to say that um, these housing conditions uh, would be addressed if housing was viewed as a human right and that access to justice uh, is absolutely necessary in order for housing to be understood as a human right. Um, the report starts with, with this claim that you know, everywhere I go, people ask me, where can I claim the right to housing? And that's actually true, that we didn't just use that as a, as a, as a gimmick for the report. Everywhere I go, I'll say, did you know that you have the right to adequate housing under international human rights law, um, or even sometimes in your own constitution, et cetera? And I am repeatedly asked, well, where do I go to get that right? And often the answer is, you don't have anywhere to go in your country yet. Um, the second point I wanted to get at is that while states don't get to determine whether to ensure access to justice, access to justice is an obligation under international human rights law for the right to housing. Um, so while they can determine um, what access to justice might look like in their own context, uh, they can't deny access to justice. They have to do something uh, to ensure access to justice. And it's there in the report that I talk about the 10 principles that Adrian alluded to, because if we're gonna say, which is the truth, <laughs> that states have an obligation to ensure access to justice for the right to adequate housing, states are going to need to know what the what that obligation looks like and so the report distills 10 um principles we probably could have come up with more frankly um and we might have and and you all might come up with different ones um or you might rank the priority of them but we came up with 10 um and they're all based in international human rights obligations so what i thought i would do is rather than going through all 10 um is just highlight some of the ones that I think are really key, really, really central. The first one um, is principle two. And you can see on your screen, I don't know if you can see it large enough, but it, it is that states must implement the right to housing within domestic legal systems. And that when they do so, the level of protection has to be consistent and on par with what's provided for in international human rights law. Often when I go into country, different countries, um, what I find is um, people saying to me, uh, oh, well, there's no way that we can, you know, amend our constitution and how could we put the, the right to uh, housing and as a justiciable right in our constitution? That would be impossible, you know, constitutional reform takes years and et cetera. And my answer to that is that while it is good to have constitutional protections and, and that's, I do like to see that as we all would, as would the people in a, in a, in a nation, um, it's not necessary that the right to housing and access to justice uh, be provided for through a constitution. It could be through just regular legislation. And I have seen that in many contexts, or I've seen it where it's a non-justiciable right in the constitution, but legislation makes it a justiciable right um, with uh, uh, through the legal system. But it, it is absolutely essential because of course it is, it is a recognition of the right to adequate housing in its purest form through law um, and, and its justiciability. Um, so I'm not just talking about naming the right to housing in a list of rights, I'm talking about ensuring that, it's, that, it, that there are mechanisms uh, attached to the right to enable it to be, um, uh, it, to enable access to justice. Um, principle four, we, it says that uh, denying access to justice cannot be justified on the basis that the right to adequate housing is not considered justiciable uh, within a state's domestic legal order. Now, this is something I encounter everywhere I go, um, where you know I, I often meet with the Supreme Court or the High Court or um, uh, uh, judges um, or you know practicing lawyers, private bar lawyers, and often I'm told that it is the position of a state that um well you know um um we can, how you know there's no way to um that that the right to adequate housing is not justiciable and so why would we enable this through the courts 
um, and like how could we enable this through the courts and it's just simply not justiciable. That's obviously a tired and old argument and not based on the reality that we'll hear from from the commentators. Um, um, but it is often used as an excuse uh, and of course we now um, are well past that with the optional protocol to the covenant on economic social and cultural rights which um, provides at the international level a legal mechanism for claiming the right to, to housing as well as um, you know courts around the world and other uh, legal mechanisms and quasi-judicial mechanisms around the world ensuring access to justice for the right to housing. Um, Another argument that I often hear, and this goes to principle five, um, is that, oh yes, um, there is access to justice for the right to adequate housing through non-discrimination and equality provisions in our constitution or in our uh, human rights legislation. Um, while, um, while that is you know, important and is an important aspect of claiming the right to housing, no doubt, um, that can lead to uh, a negative obligations approach to the right to adequate housing, which is insufficient. Of course, we know that there are negative and positive obligations that attach to the implementation of all human rights, um, including uh, the right to adequate housing. And, it, and it's important that where access to justice exists, it exists in a fulsome way to all components of the right to adequate housing, which would include to its positive obligations. So in other words, for example, in the situation of homelessness, you could argue under non-discrimination um, that the failure of the state to ensure uh, uh, freedom from homelessness, um, uh, you could argue that as a, a negative obligation, but, but what is it that is required for persons living in homelessness might be some kind of shelter or long-term and long-term housing. And that would be a positive obligation. So you need to be able to argue both and, and the, the justice system must be responsive to that. Um, and the last principle that I'll highlight is um, um, principle eight. And this goes directly to where governments are most comfortable. So when I um, am on mission or I'm talk in conversation with governments, what I find um, is they're very comfortable talking about the myriad of housing policies and programs that they have on the books and that they're working on. And I have no doubt that most governments are genuine in believing that those housing policies and programs are an important aspect of addressing right to housing concerns. Um, but but that's not enough. And um, um, I have argued here in this Access to Justice report, but in all of my reports, that it's really important that all decision making around housing policies and programs and related policies and programs, whether they're in the finance department or the justice department, that all decisions are made in a manner that considers and is consistent with the right to adequate housing. Um, so if I move now to my third big point for you to take away, um, it's the idea that access to justice should extend beyond courts. Now, before I get there, I'm just going to put one last principle on the table, and that is um, principle six, which says that states may delegate components of access to justice for the right to housing to administrative bodies, uh, but judicial remedies must be available when needed. So this gets to my to my third point. Um, it will always be important that there be uh, recourse to judicial uh, remedies because sometimes it's going to be important if you're in a non or a quasi judicial um, mechanism. Um, it may be that that quasi judicial mechanism doesn't actually or non judicial mechanism um, doesn't uh, actually protect everyone's rights and that it, there may be need um, to, to have recourse um, to uh, a judicial system. For example, I've, I've seen it in some cases where um, local or community councils are set up to deal with issues um, related to the right to housing. Uh, but when it comes to violence against women, those community councils don't actually um, um, deal well with violence against women in their homes. And, and those women sometimes are better placed to go to a different venue and, and seek judicial remedies uh, and legally enforceable remedies. Um, so just bearing that in mind, 
um, I do think it's really important that we not over over emphasize courts when we talk about access to justice, because in many cases that's not going to be a viable and a um, the best place for people go to go to claim their um, their uh, uh, right to adequate housing. I my time is short, so I will just say that in the report, what I cover is the valuable role that national human rights institutions play. Um, and and I've seen recently, I did a session um, at the last meeting of all national human rights institutions in Geneva. I did a session on access to justice with a grouping and um, there was a lot of appetite amongst human rights institutions to do more on the right to adequate housing. Institutions that aren't currently really seized with it, wanting to and, and recognizing the need for them to move into this area um, because housing is one of the chief concerns and there is a, a, in cities across the world and there is a global housing crisis. I will also put on the table the need, of course, to have access to justice where other actors are involved. We, Adrian mentioned the commodification of housing. The business sector is playing a huge role in housing right now, um, especially private equity firms um, and um, major asset management firms. And there has to be access to justice for any harms uh, um, that they um, uh, create in the area of housing, but also to, to ensure that they are regulated and are actually also part of the implementation of the right to housing. And lastly, um, I think that we should be talking about informal and customary justice systems, and I'm hoping that some of the commentators might weigh in on that if they're relevant in their own uh, country contexts. So I'll leave it there, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the comments. Thanks so much. Thank you, Leilani, for <clears throat> very clear and thoughtful remarks and uh, really now we're going to turn to our discussions and their role is quite simple which is to take up the challenge um, presented by Le Leilani which is to really answer we've posed a couple of questions to get the conversation going about you know what's one thing in the report that resonates the most for you are there things missing and Leilani mentioned there there's 10 principles there could have been more should there have been more should others have been emphasized more and and also in the process to describe a main challenge in achieving access to justice um, for the right to housing in your context and maybe what are some stories of success um, that you've encountered in, in doing it and and really one takeaway from Leilani's um, remarks is that the right to housing to be real is grounded needs to be grounded in legal frameworks that provide mechanisms that enable the use and claim of rights and so I'll turn it over now to our commentators to, to tell us what does that mean um, practically so first jumping to Megan Chapman of the Justice and Empowerment Initiatives um, in Nigeria thank you Megan and welcome We can't hear you just yet. Um, Adrian, thank you, Leilani. I'm going to put my video to turn it off to Amati and to IDRC for organizing this. Um, I'll just say at the beginning that every time I listen to Leilani talk, I find myself nodding emphatically. So anyone who was seeing my video, Um, would have seen me Megan, not emphatically as she was talking. Um, Megan, if you can hear us, yes. So if you can maybe turn off your camera, Sorry? please. So we're having a bit of challenge with your audio and your feed. Okay, so you turned off the webcam. If you turn off the webcam, please. I now hope you can still hear me. Thank you. Um, so the Federation is a movement of the urban poor. Sorry? We can hear you well now. Please continue. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the Federation is a movement of urban poor living, uh, people coming from uh, hundreds of informal settlements and slum communities across Nigeria, for example, here in Lagos, present in nearly 150 informal settlements in a city of 23 million people, um, where 67% of the population is estimated to live in slums. 
according to the UN habitat definition. So this gives us a sense of, of the scale of uh, what I would what I would love to talk into reflecting on this report is to really sh share some of the lessons that I have learned living and working in rights um, uh, and legal empowerment of the urban poor um, over the last decade. And the major takeaway that I have is that in everything we do, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I came out of law school. I was steeped in, in human rights um, framework and human rights law, and I came here hoping to work with the urban poor to defend their rights through the courts. And my major, major takeaway has been that we need to always focus on what is the most pragmatic way of finding solutions to the problems that the urban poor face around um, forced eviction issues, around housing rights, um, and that continues to be my takeaway. So. Um, basically, I will share a few lessons learned and some of the achievements that we've made in terms of advancing Sorry, Megan, you've cut out. If you could try to jump back maybe 20 seconds, please. We're still having trouble with Megan. We can wait um, a little bit longer uh, just to, while I take this time, please, while we're listening. Tried. Sorry? Okay, we're, we're hearing you now. Sorry, Megan, you, you've um, cut off again. What I would propose to do, maybe just given time is short, um, maybe you need to reestablish your connection and the team in the background can maybe help you reconnect. Um, I just worry we have a, um, we might lose too much time. And, and I'll say to all the participants in the meantime, please feel free to send in questions as the panelists are speaking. Uh, we don't have to wait until the end and we've already gotten a couple of nice ones come in um, megan can you try speaking one last time and if not we can try a reconnection okay that's a shame and we'll hopefully try to get megan on um, at the end um, and and really, you were just getting to the, the real richness of your discussion, and we'll hopefully leave the anticipation for more. Um, we're going to jump to Pablo um, in Argentina while hopefully we can resolve the technical issues with Megan. And again, our, our real apologies and regrets that the um, to everyone that the technical issues aren't quite working out. We're connecting across many countries, so it's always impressive when we do connect. Please, Pablo. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Very okay. well, thank you. Okay, first of all, we want to thank for the invitation and also to the special rapporteur for highlighting the close relationship between access to justice and the right to housing. Yes? Sorry. Uh, the, this, this close relationship between access to justice and right to housing, it's something I that... I am missing something. Mm -hmm. Okay, that we think that it's... Uh, um, uh, so, sorry? we... Oh. Um, I'll get an example to show how far we've gone in trying to build okay. this... Will, will we, we talk a little bit later, okay? Sorry. So, Megan, go ahead, please. We had jumped to Argentina because we, we've had silence for the last couple of minutes. Please do try again. And thank you, everyone, for bearing with the technical challenges. 
I okay. So should I check? Okay, Megan, if you can hear us, we're going to jump to Argentina just now, and we're going to try to resolve your technical issues, please. Okay. We, we start again. Well, but, uh, well, to thank both things, to the, the participation in the, in the webinar and the, and the report. Um, we think the right to the housing and the right to access to justice are both essential human rights, that have been widely recognized by the Constitution in Latin America, at least here we have a lot of recognition of both rights. But, however, when we analyze how they are satisfied by the state, we observe that there is a huge gap between the written laws and what happens in reality. Latin America, as you know, it's the most unequal and the second most urbanized region of the world. For example, in Argentina, the 90% of its population lives in cities, and the city of Buenos Aires, uh, in the city of Buenos Aires, the 10% of its population lives in informal settlements, and maybe the third, the, a third of the population live in, in bad housing conditions. Uh, and we are uh, currently researching about that uh, in an action research project that we are developing in NACIG, together with the Fundación Construir in Bolivia and Corporación Andina de Acción Popular in Ecuador, with the support of IDRC, and uh, which aims to reflect on, uh, on legal empowerment practices that have been developed in these uh, countries uh, right now uh, by communities living in informal settlements in order to reverse uh, urban segregation. This uh, research, uh, it's uh, have been, it's developing in Buenos Aires, La Paz, and Quito, and in some uh, informal settlements there. Uh, in this sense, our observations in the, in the research project uh, and agreeing with the report's outcomes that we heard, uh, legal empowerment appears to us as a perfect way to democratize the use of law, attempting, attempting to introduce communities who don't participate in the decision-making process regarding to laws that will affect them in, uh, in these legal discussions. We understand that, only, that, the, that the only way to tackle the barriers of access to justice and urban segregation in Latin America uh, is by the active participation of the affected groups in the decision of policies that will the, involve them. For these reasons, we are sure that this report and, and all these practices that are developing in, in Latin America that links the access to justice beyond the courts and focuses on the enforcement of, it, uh, of this right by the people and not just by the states, is a step forward in the sense of putting law in the affected community's hands. And we think it's part of the, the struggle to uh, make the rights effective to these people. Okay. Thank you so much to our colleagues uh, in Argentina. And just to keep moving along, we'll uh, pass now to Emily Kanama from the Katiba Institute in Nairobi to describe experiences there. Thank you, Emily, and thank you also to Pablo for your comments. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to the Global um, Legal Empowerment Network for allowing us this opportunity to share our, our lessons, learned and some of the challenges that we've experienced in Kenya. So I'll start with the first question to describe some of the main challenges in achieving access to justice for the right to housing. So I work under two aspects. I work firstly as a litigator in court, um, representing communities that are facing um, forceful evictions, mostly from public land that belongs to the government. And then secondly, I work in a project um, that seeks to to upgrade an informal settlement in Nairobi known as Mukuru that has um, a population of about 100,000 um, households in 550 acres. So that, those are the two areas that I work in. So what are my key challenges? My main challenges are usually that there are still forceful and illegal evictions in Kenya, even with our very good constitution that sometimes surpasses some of the international laws, if I must say so. And then secondly, what um, 
how are we trying to achieve this success in terms of um, reali realizing the right to housing, I would say that I go back to the question that is in the report, where do I go to claim my right to housing? So in Kenya, it will be two instances, either through the courts or trying to implement public participation with a local authority or with the government. So those are the two areas where we'll try achieve it. So um, my, key, my key challenge as well would be that the government is not including or having a rights-based approach in terms of public participation to realize the right to adequate housing. Okay, secondly, the second question that I will share with you is one thing that the report resonates for me the most in the context of the work that I do. I think for me, three key principles stand out. The first thing will be principle one, which um, I think most of you might, might, must have already seen, but what stands out for me under principle one, I'll just read it very quickly, which states that access to justice must be ensured by all appropriate means and address the needs of diverse groups. For us, most of evictions take place either with indigenous communities or in informal settlements. So um, we have to think of how to include the diverse groups. However, it also relies on a wide range of approaches, which for me is very interesting. We don't, we not only rely on courts, we also rely on other approaches, which I'll discuss later on. The second principle is that as discussed by Lenny and Fara, which is principle two, that the state must implement the right to adequate housing within the domestic legal system, so as to provide the, at least the same level of protection as is offered under international law. And this goes to the state's obligations in terms of respecting, protecting, and fulfilling the right to adequate housing. So in Kenya, our constitution goes above and also includes the right, this is already legislated in, within our constitution, and it includes also the addition to promote over and above respecting, protecting, and fulfilling. So that is quite key for us. And then secondly, the right also to physical shelter and more or less the negative obligation not to evict more so and not to have retrogressive measures because our constitution also recognizes that progressive, the progressive realization of social economic rights. And then thirdly also, we're using other mechanism. Our constitution also recognizes public participation as a key pillar of our national values and principles, which all state organs must adhere to when undertaking or implementing or interpreting the constitution or policy. So that is quite key. Anything that I can say is missing, or oh, and thirdly, the principle eight, that states must promote decision-making that is consistent with the right to adequate housing. For us, this is very central and key, and we keep arguing it in courts, and also when we approach um, the local government in the Mukuru project, it's been a key feature that they must recognize um, in their decision making that they think about the right to adequate housing, not just as a right, but how it's interlinked as well with other rights, such as the right to life, the right to dignity, and that if you don't um, have the social economic right, which is recognized in the constitution, it will inevitably affect other rights. So anything missing from the report? I don't think so. It's tried to capture a lot of things. I think with also the general comments that I've already discussed, um, that have previously discussed or provided guidelines on evictions, if we use both of these together, I think it can really help in real realizing this right. And then some of the main successes, I'll definitely say how we've used the informal justice system over and above the court system. Because for the Mukuru special planning area, project we had, the court systems are not working. They were delayed and they couldn't effectively deal with the complex land issue and housing issues. So we, a multidisciplinary approach was used where civil societies and research-based organizations in different sectors, water and sanitation, in urban planning, in law as well, worked together with the county government in conjunction with the community, which was very key. How do we involve the community in realizing service delivery as well as also the right to adequate housing in an informal settlement? So it's a very fast, I think, in Africa. And I think other countries are really looking forward to see if there are gains that are made in this, which is a research-based project, then it could be used in other countries as well. Um, and then also the use that courts have also decided, and um, one of the key uh, success stories is that the courts have also decided in one of the cases how public participation and the community working with the government together with other organizations was able to ensure 
um, adequate, um, that the community was adequately resettled in a World Bank project from living in a railway line and to get adequate housing that was um, built for them. So that was also, is actually a key issue. A challenge remains that forceful and illegal eviction still exists, that the government still and continuously disobeys court orders, even when there are stay orders that um, that are strictly put out not to evict people. I think that's a key challenge we still face. We have a good constitution, we have ratified all these treaties and we have good legislation that should be followed, but I think the implementation is a key challenge. And then thirdly, co concrete public um, policies. Sorry, I'm gonna jump in here that's and it. give a chance to other, just because we've lost some time with our, uh, and I uh, apologies for the uh, interruption and we'll, you'll get a chance at the end to come back to your, um, but very helpful and powerful remarks. Let's jump to Maria Civili, Silvia Emanuele in Mexico. And, and thanks again, Emily. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thanks to Leilani for this great and necessary report. Well, I would like to share from Mexico that uh, the Mexican constitution, we have the right to the city. The recognition was uh, 30 years ago now. And eight years ago, uh, we had the so-called human rights constitutional reform that established that all human rights rule must be re uh, read in light of constitutional and relevant treaties. As you know, uh, uh, as in other Latin American country, we can, we can defend the human right to housing through the AMPARO, that is a procedure that protects human rights. Even, even so, we have really few judicial decisions on the subject and in general on economic, social and cultural rights. And the reasons are really uh, multiple and I don't have the time to analyze them, but I want to say that um, this is one point. We have the, the way to defend uh, right to the city, but really few decisions. What I would like to focus on is in the work we are doing now is about trials that allow rental eviction. A big problem that we identify uh, is in the civil and criminal trials that lead to the eviction of tenants. The right to housing of the victim is not contemplated because the property rights are the only one to be uh, protected in a way to say this uh, easily. Judges and lawyer um, tenants um, and even the Human Rights Commission of Mexico City, for example, consider that this is so since the conflict that justified the eviction is between private. So the victim is not hurt and not alternative accommodation are offered. Uh, at the present, we don't know any judicial case of this type that has veiled the right to housing of a tenant. And as a practical barrier, we have many corru corruption problems related, for example, to the work of notaries that should certify ownership, the public registry of property, and even the judges. And all of this affects the due uh, process. What we think is really important in the report, uh, as the other panelists said, is principle eight. We really think that in the case of eviction, we must build a framework with participation of population that allow to articulate all decision, all policies in the matter from the vision of the right to housing, a framework that also includes the regulation of private actors. And we don't really see much progress on this sense in Mexico. And even it's complex to convince authority about the importance of dealing with eviction in Mexico City. For example, we have almost 3,000 judicial eviction every year, but nobody wants really to work on this uh, issue at the public sector. We are working a lot, we are pushed them, but it's a difficult um, situation that we face when we speak with them. Uh, what is missing from the report? Well, the report is really great, it's really useful. Uh, I share uh, it with the people we work with, that is evic evicted people. Maybe um, what is missing is analyzing the tension with, between property rights 
and human rights to housing and the need to open the recognition of social function of housing as a way to recognize housing rights. And also maybe because of the Mexico situation, the corruption problems that we face. Um, about a successful story, I would like to share that uh, in December, uh, we've worked with affected people on Article 60 uh, for the new human rights law of Mexico City that provide that forced eviction may be carried out only in exceptional cases. This is what we have at this article at the moment. And before being carried out, the person to be evicted have the right to not to be discriminated, to study all other possibilities that allow avoiding force, do compensation, and to have due process guarantees, which includes the obligation of the judge to hear the person who may be displaced. And after this, the competent authorities must guarantee to the maximum of their capacity the adequate rehousing of the person without resource evicting, if possible, as close as their uh, previous uh, place. And on the absence of a specific le legislation to protect tenants, uh, we have just a few rules at the civil code. We are also, also working uh, in a law initiative on the subject for Mexico City. We are finished the uh, legislation at the moment, the initiative, and we would like maybe to share with you uh, the document. And we are also working with the Human Rights Commission uh, of Mexico City to recommend appropriate remedies action or, or policies responsive to force evictions. And I don't think I have more time, but I can share maybe after some ideas for concrete uh, politic uh, policies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria Silvia. So for the way we're going to do it for the remaining part of the discussion, we are going to turn to Megan first in Nigeria, who has managed to join on. And then right after her, we're going to go to Leilani for some concluding reflections and remarks. Um, Leilani has to leave pretty much right at 11 or just after. And then we can continue on a bit longer because we lost some time with the panelists for some um, discussions and final remarks. So please, Megan, try again. And thank you so much for your patience in working through the technical issues. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to everyone for um, the brilliant presentations, and thank you for your patience with our um, internet here in Lagos. Um, I, I actually would like to pick up, I, I think I gave a bit of introduction, I'm not sure how much people got, but um, uh, the, here in Nigeria, um, the, we're, we're in a place where we are still fighting forced evictions. We have what would be called a second generation constitution in the human rights world, meaning that we essentially have a constitution that only recognizes and protects um, uh, civil and political rights. And yet we are doing our very possible best with the, the tools that are available to us um, to try to advance protection for uh, the right to housing um, through the courts and outside of the courts. Um, and I think that um, the major focus of my comments and the question that I'll frame at the end relates to how how can we be very pragmatic in thinking about how to use this report? Um, because pragmatism is what we have had to use in Nigeria to find solutions. Um, the example I start with is a case of 300,000 people who were forcibly evicted in Lagos uh, in the year 1990 um, with less than seven days notice. Um, and that's a community called Morocco. When I first got to Nigeria uh, and inherited this case from previous lawyers who'd been working on it. Um, we were at the very end stages and we saw a judgment uh, that was given in the year 2012, 22 years after that community had first gone to court to seek, um, actually seek interventions of the court to stop the eviction. Uh, and 22 years later, the court of first instance came out and said that there had been no violation of fundamental rights. Um, so you can imagine here in Nigeria that many people don't believe in the courts. They don't believe that the courts are there to protect them because of that legacy. Um, there's also, you know, massive misunderstanding of the law um, and a massive, uh, let's say, a disempowered approach to understanding what the law says. And so we started to work on a, uh, supporting the growth of a grassroots movement across 144 informal settlements in Lagos, also in Port Harcourt. Um, and part, one aspect of that social movement is 
a legal empowerment movement. We've trained 12 classes of community paralegals, helped them to understand what the law around land and the laws that regulate the government's power to demolish um, actually say and the ways that they protect them, um, as opposed to focusing on the things that aren't within the law at, at, at this stage. Um, through that kind of mobilization, we've been able to see some major advances in terms of access to justice. Um, the example I'll give now is the case of 40 waterfront communities that joined hands in the face of a threatened eviction in 2016. Uh, we took the case to court um, at the, actually the same court that had given the judgment in 2012 um, that I mentioned before. And after a very long you know, uh, struggle over the course of nine months, the, the court came out and one, gave an injunction against eviction of the waterfront communities, and two, found that evicting people from their homes without resettlement and without adequate notice, um, uh, irrespective of their tenure status, constitutes a violation of the right to dignity enshrined in Nigeria's constitution. So this is a huge step forward from where we were just four years or five years earlier. Um, however, on the ground, even where we've made that, that progress in the courts, um, and that progress was due to social mobilization, was due to massive media attention, was due to international outcry, including from Leilani and others who came out and condemned the evictions that were going on in Nigeria, that even, in the, even while the um, court order was there um, preventing the evictions, and even after the government had been ordered to sit in court-ordered mediation with the communities to find alternatives to eviction, the, the government still went ahead to carry out the eviction of a community called Otodobame and displace over 30,000 people. So we have a paper judgment that's in favor of, of communities. We do believe that it has prevented the eviction of many communities, but at the same time, you still have displacement and you still have a government that's unwilling to implement the judgments that have been given in favor. Um, so what that really leads me to, to saying here is that access to justice is important. Um, and in fact, you know, this idea that political will is at the heart of it is, is really the point I think we need to focus on. And the question or the challenge that I would throw to, you know, this group in our discussions is how can we use a report like what Leilani has put together here and force or put pressure at the international and global level on global institutions to try to do their part? Because as we see it, we're working at the grassroots, putting pressure on the states and on the governments from the bottom up. And we're doing you know, as much as we can here on the ground. And, and I think we're making some progress. Um, but at the same time, what we're seeing is that the state, you know, the state that's ultimately responsible, most of these recommendations are geared towards the states. And we don't see the same pressures for accountability coming from the global institutions, um, not mentioning, you know, uh, Leilani, who has made incredible efforts, and you know some other um, institutions, but at the level of global institutions like the World Bank, um, even you know in 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 some of the UN circles, I think there's a question of how do we try to um, make sure that these kinds of recommendations, which are absolutely spot on, there's some teeth behind them to help try to put pressure um, to 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 strengthen and support. Um, the efforts of grassroots activists on the ground to, to try to end evictions, to try to strengthen the right to, to adequate shelter, um, and so on. So I'll, I'll, I have many more things to say, but I'll stop there and allow the discussion to go on. Thank you so much, Megan. And just a, a reminder that these the complexity of the questions and the, that they're at so many levels and also that success also, is often mixed and, and by no means guaranteed. We've come to 11 o'clock and so what I'm proposing we do and I hope everyone um, is amenable to this is we'll turn the floor to Leilani um, just to give some last reflections and comments because she does have to run off and on, on any points really that you, you, you wish to speak to Leilani whether Megan's just final call on how to make the report pragmatic. There were questions that came up in the discussion and also online about the link between human rights and the right to housing, uh, sorry, property rights. Um, really just your, your final thoughts, as much time as you can spare, and then we'll, we'll keep going with the discussion for a few minutes more. Thanks again also for your participation and to Megan. Thanks, and it's, it's, it's too bad that we couldn't have a, a much longer discussion because I found 
the commentators far more interesting than me and and really brought a richness to the discussion. Um, I, I, I am always amazed by the work that's going on on the ground. Um, and of course, I'm always incredibly heartened to hear what's coming out of Kenya, uh, I have to admit, um, only because it seems like it's like this, there is this progress um, um, that's really uh, amazing to, to see unfold. I'm not saying there aren't problems, I, I, I do understand. Um, I actually was really taken with Sylvie's, um, uh, the area that she's working in and the quandary there and this, um, the battle between property rights and and human rights. And of course, I see that playing itself in many places. As I said, I was just in France. That's a very strong tension uh, in France, absolutely. And, and it is in fact a strong tension in many places that I visit. Um, uh, and and I would have to agree that, that uh, the report as it stands doesn't completely grapple with it. We grappled, I grappled with it in the financialization report a little bit and in the informal settlement report. Um, but perhaps um, uh, my successor will pick up that challenge um, because it's not on my slate. Uh, but I do think it's so very interesting, the idea, um, I mean, evictions of the judicial kind that Sylvie is talking about is something happening in so many different places. I think in the report we say an eviction happens every four minutes a judicial eviction happens every four minutes in the United States. In Spain, for example, it's a huge issue. Um, obviously, in Mexico City, it's a huge issue, as Sylvie has pointed out. And I do think some concerted effort in that regard is would be really useful. Some kind. I have to think. I'm going to think about this. Um, how could we do something global um, with that? Because I do think that that's a, a very. Um, it's au courant. It's um, a here and now issue. Uh, in so many uh, places around the around the globe, um, in terms of you know how to get the big global um, institutions, oh to to get to you know to engage this within their own domains like the World Bank um, that used to have um, slightly better um, mechanisms to actually hear people and and you know how to get them to actually take this seriously and. Um, that's a very good question, and 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 I do think that that's uh, an area of work that also needs to be done. There should be um, more than one uh, uh, UN special rapporteur. I think there should be lots. Uh, uh, or what we should really do is try to figure out how to um, amplify these issues that are coming from the ground up at that at the at the global level. I have been trying to work on that a little bit, but. Um, it is, uh, there is so much resistance from these big global actors, uh, whether it's um, a global institution like the World Bank or global actors that I've identified, for example, um, the big private e equity firms who have no sense that people matter, that the voices of people should be heard, that their experiences are experiences of rights violations. Um, it amazes me how people around the world whether they understand international human rights law or domestic law or not, people know when their rights are being violated and they, they, they know it viscerally and they articulate it that way through notions like dignity. And um, you know they have a sense, people know that they should be able to voice these concerns and have them addressed in a meaningful way and through some mechanism. So it's amazing to me that these institutions seem to be blind to this. Um, so obviously lots and lots of work to do. And I, as I said, I think this area access to justice is one of the thorniest with the right to housing. Um, I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> uh, the big actors don't necessarily want to hear from the people. And so that's our big challenge. Um, Anyway, I really appreciate this conversation. I do hope that we're able to do like a phase two or a part two. Um, I'll leave it there. I do have to run to an interview. So um, thank you all very much for your inputs. And um, I'm sorry I can't stay a little bit longer. Thank you so much, Leilani. There will be an immediate phase two to the conversation online and we'll um, send some uh, information about that shortly um, in the next day or two. Um, and then we're definitely interested in, in, um, in thinking about what a phase two conversation could be and people please send in ideas. Um, what we'll do then to conclude um, 
our discussion today, a large majority of the participants are still online, so that says to me there's still a bit of time and flexibility, is we'll turn to the panelists um, to provide some reflections, reactions, and maybe also to address some of the questions that have come out already. One is about how to get the big actors to hear from people and, and engage global institutions and processes. Um, another would be this question of the relations between property right and tenure security and um, human rights and right to housing, um, and also questions of structural change and discrimination. We don't have time for everyone to answer all those questions, but maybe take a couple of minutes each. We'll go across um, the panelists. Um, and then we can follow up online in the coming days. So I'd like to go first to Emily in Kenya, since I very ungracefully cut her off earlier. So please, um, Emily, if you'd like to add to the discussion, reflect on some of the questions. If you had other points, Bernie, you'd like to make just a couple of minutes, then we'll um, we'll jump to Pablo in Argentina, uh, we'll go back to Megan, and then Maria Silvia, and we'll hopefully wrap up in the next 10 minutes or so. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I think I don't have much to add. I think I, I, I also agree with Marie Sylvia when she talks about the tension between the right to property and the right um, and, and securing basically the right to property and dealing with the right to adequate housing. I think in all countries it, it faces us. It's a question to be determined currently before our Supreme Court. How do we balance the tension between the two? And at the end of it all, we try to argue that um, even if the property does not, because most of the property in which most of, uh, most of the land in which most of informal settlements are dwelling is public land. But what we're talking about is how do you in a dignified manner ensure that you respect the rights of those who are, are dwelling there? And if you resort to moving them, can you do it in a dignified manner, A? Eh? and offer them alternative housing that will also recognize their rights. I think that's what we try argue throughout. And then um, secondly, in terms of holding most of these corporations accountable, I think advocacy might, will play such a big, big role. In Kenya, we've had instances where the advocacy has been so strong that some of these multinational agencies or international organizations that fund um, projects and there are violent evictions or forceful evictions that take place in these areas. We've heard that advocacy has really helped in order to realize the rights of those people who are affected. And we've had organizations such as the World Bank go back to the drawing board to see that um, rights are upheld when major development projects are going to affect the right to adequate housing. Um, I think, yes, and finally to conclude, um, governments must still recognize, we might have like Kenya, all these wonderful laws, but they're still not being implemented or the government is not respecting. So the respecting promotion and fulfilling of these state obligations is key in ensuring that the right to adequate housing is upheld. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily. On to you, Pablo, please. Please unmute your microphone. Sorry, can you hear? Okay. Sorry, just to reflect uh, about uh, what, what everybody say and the, the experience in Argentina, we, we, we just to add to the other things, uh, two, two ideas related with the, with the access to justice and the risk of a formal uh, way to think about that. Uh, one, it's, for example, in Buenos Aires, we have a lot of public defense institutions in, in for example, shanty towns in slums, and uh, the people apparently have uh, the right to access to justice guaranteed, but uh, what happens sometimes is that some uh, process have to go to the judiciary system and it's like something like a, another step that the people have to uh, uh, to make to access, for example, to a public service or to a uh, to a benefit of uh, of the government of the city government, and that could be another thing to uh, add to the classical uh, organization of the people. And by the other side, we think that it's important to think all the all these. Uh, 
dispositives of right to, the, to access to the justice uh, as part of a complex of, of other tools that the people have to be have to use to access to the right to the city. Yeah, yeah in this sense, like uh, we are trying to understand access to justice uh, as a whole strategy because now in the city of Buenos Aires, we are challenging some urbanization processes in for informal settlements. So our kind of intervention has uh, has shifted. And, and in this sense, uh, the, the courts are not just the ones in charge of guaranteeing access to justice. And, and that's like a, a new challenge we are trying to face. Great, thank you so much. And, and a belated welcome to Felipe Messel also of SD. Um, please, Megan, if you have any um, final comments, please. Thank you very much, Adrian, and thank you to everyone. Um, what I'll just quickly touch on, I mean, it goes in a slightly different direction, but it was the other point I had wanted to make. Um, I think the report um, puts a lot of um, interesting focus on strengthening alternatives to judicial systems. And this is something that we've also tried to engage with in Nigeria, um, specifically through the National Human Rights Commission, um, which around the time that we were feeling quite despairing about the options uh, before the courts was presenting itself as a viable alternative and actually had taken interest in the issue of uh, forced evictions of the urban poor and demolitions affecting the urban poor and had convened a, a panel of inquiry um, in the year 2013 in Nigeria looking into those issues. Um, we actually helped to bring more than 17 displaced communities cases before the National Human Rights Commission here in Nigeria. Um, trying to see how that would work as an alternative um, because the National Human Rights Commission had the power to grant remedy and was exercising that power for the very first time um, in Nigeria at the time. Now, um, over the course of about two years, there were multiple hearings. Um, uh, and then when there was a change of administration, one government went out, one government came in in, two, in 2015. And suddenly the governing council to the National Human Rights Commission here in Nigeria was, um, uh, was uh, disbanded, uh, was dissolved. And the, um, the inquiry promptly ended. Um, and we haven't had any action since 2015. Um, so this is where I start thinking about like what are the what are the backups for these? How do we strengthen these institutions um, where there is political will? People are starting to take steps. Then suddenly you see the political will evaporate with a change of administration or what have you. Now what we chose to do was before we well let me jump forward. Where we are currently is that we've taken a case to the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice, which is the regional human rights court here in West Africa, um, or the regional court that has human rights jurisdiction here in West Africa. And we've taken the case against the Federal Republic of Nigeria and against the National Human Rights Commission for basically violating the right to adequate remedy and violating the right to um, due, due process and fair hearing um, without undue delay because there was simply an end to a process without any actual conclusion or decision coming out of it. Now, that's where we are now, and we're hoping to see a positive outcome. We welcome anyone who has ideas to support our strategic litigation ongoing there. But um, in the intervening years before we did that, we actually reached out to the various UN bodies and mechanisms that exist um, that are there to try to support and um, accredit national human rights institutions, because we saw this as an assault on the independence of the national human rights institution here in Nigeria and we thought that those institutions could put some pressure and we didn't see much of a response and that is where I'm saying kind of when we get down to nuts and bolts and we take these practical examples I think we need to be you know in as much as we're giving recommendations to states and we're supporting grassroots movements we need to look at the international mechanisms and see how those can also be strengthened and held accountable so they do their own part in holding accountable. It's, I'm, I'm hitting the same point, but I want to bring that example because it kind of brings everything together in a way. Um, alternatives are important when people have options where they can go to seek justice. We know that justice will be better, um, but, uh, but we still have to strengthen all the different options um, and use pragmatic measures to do that. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks again, Megan. And uh, Maria, Sylvia, if you have some uh, yeah. final 
remarks, Thank please. you. I need to run. I just want to uh, propose uh, so a discussion on property rights and human rights to housing, maybe for the near future, and uh, telling that uh, we have here a seminary on strategic litigation economic on economic, social, and cultural rights in Mexico. We don't have many cases, as I told you before. We have just three or four at the Supreme Court that are not really interesting, uh, really classic cases in a way. So I would like maybe to invite some of you um, to share your experiences in the part of human rights to housing that I'm teaching. So, well, uh, maybe we can speak after about this because learning to each other still really important. So thank you very much for this invitation and the other presentation. And I'm sorry, I, I need to leave uh, now. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking around as long as you could. And so this concludes the uh, formal part of our call. And I'm going to do um, two things. First, thank everyone who's taken part to the participants, um, but also to our presenters, Megan, Pablo, Emily, Maria, and also Leilani. Um, but a, an extra special thanks goes out to the Global Legal Empowerment Network team, Luciana, Madeline, Mohammed, and Tobias, who made this all work in the background quite seamlessly. Um, and really just to reflect on a couple of points then from the discussion, I think what came out very nicely in the end is the need for coordinated um, and collective action um, across institutions, across different levels, national, regional, global, and then um, and together, in a sense, we're stronger. And, and that was very much the spirit of this discussion. And we, we've set the table. The meal is yet to come. And so we have a real big menu now of future discussions and possible topics. Um, so thank you, for everyone, for joining us. If you'd like to, um, and for all your questions, we captured a few of them just now. If you'd like to keep the questions going and the discussion going, and if you have other comments you'd like to make, please head over to uh, the post on our online forum, on the Global Legal Empowerments Forum, um, and we can keep the discussion going in this way. We'll send around an email um, with more information on how to do that in the next day or two, also with links about all the organizations um, that you've heard from in Mexico, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, and Argentina. And so really, thank you everyone um, for tuning in, for staying extra long, and also again to our participants and to the organizing team. Um, have a nice day. Um, evening or afternoon and take care to everyone. Goodbye.